thank you for this day and time. And Lord, we, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, that you are a caring Father who calls us to take care of the orphan. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would be with this hour so that we can really call attention uh, to what is happening around the world and, and how the church can respond to that. It's all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, uh, probably one of the mics. You can, you can grab. So I wanted to take today, this is what we call Orphan Sunday. So with, with this uh, day here, essentially, once a year, we're seeing churches uh, around the nation take part in what's called Orphan Sunday. So a lot of churches today will have their entire day dedicated to uh, talking about foster care or foster care awareness or for us here, uh, orphans, etc. And essentially, it's just to call attention and to direct the church's attention to uh, what we call the global orphan crisis. And uh, when we had done all of our adoptions, and we were in a different church, we were in a different community, so you guys just know us now after some of that stuff. And, and we really wanted to take time and, and just share um, our heart, our experience, and, and what's going on. So I want to share with you briefly just a story um, of, of why this means so much to me. As a, as a pastor, I had been around a lot of missions work, and you guys do a fantastic job here at this church uh, with missions. How, how many of you are well aware of all the missions we support here? I mean, we, we've got missions all over the globe here. here. Here was my rub. I was adopted in 1980, uh, and, and I, was, I was adopted in Tuscross County, Ohio, and grew up with a wonderful family, had a great life and, and everything there. Adoption was always something that meant a lot to me because it was personal. The only reason I really cared about adoption was because I was adopted and, and my family was fantastic and I wanted that experience for somebody else. But lo and behold, like I, I really did not have much more to go off of than that. I had been in, or a pastor who supported missions very heavily. I have always advocated for missions very heavily. So I want to rewind. 2015, it's October, we are in Kharkiv, Ukraine, and we come off of the train, and our facilitator, Tatiana, greets us, and she takes us over into a car where they're going to take us to meet our daughter, Raya. So as we're going over to meet Raya, she gives us her story, which is horrific, we'll talk about that later. She gives us her story and everything that entailed with it. We go into the uh, hospital walk up to the second floor and we meet Raya and it's this it's everything you thought it's this joyous moment where you get to meet your daughter for the first time and it was it was really magical and again we'll hit on that here in a little bit but what really broke uh, me was while we met Raya in the corner of the room there was a caddy cornered crib and it was cast iron white bars and inside there was a child and uh, shaved head gray like scrubs hospital attire and uh, everybody's talking to Raya, and I'm just sitting here with this child, and I'm thinking, like, what, you know, just, just in terrible shape, and, and cr cradled up a little bit, probably looked to be 9 or 10 years old, which I assume now probably older, and um, no one cared about this child sitting there, just, just no one cared. So I asked if I could go down and get a toy to bring up for this boy, and Tatiana grabs me, and she's humiliating, and she says, uh, Trevor, uh, that is a girl. We, we shaved her head for hygiene purposes, but that, that is actually a girl. It broke me. It broke me. So next day she's gone. I have no idea where she went or, or whatever happened to her. I don't know her name. That, that always what it is. The next week we met a family from Osborne's. Were they from? You might need to stand a little bit over the, my way. I don't smell. The camera stuff for YouTube is the it's center of the nice. stage. It's all good. This way. <laughs> yeah, you need to talk in the mic when you talk. Um, the Osborne family, um, what state were they from? I can't remember. Alabama is what I think. So I know they were Alabama fans, so they probably had a bad day yesterday. But anyway, um, so we met this family, and they, were, they had just finished adopting four separate non-biological Down syndrome children. They were all 16 years old. They were aging out of the orphanage. And this family from Alabama just said, we're going to go adopt all four of them. 
They spent several months in Ukraine. Uh, their whole family came over to help them with everything, and it was severely handicapped. So in Ukraine, Down syndrome, I mean, you're, you're discarded. So their one daughter alone, her name was Ruby, she was, she was 16 years old. I kid you not, she weighed 19 pounds. It was terrible. So they were telling us stories about how they would go in the morning to see her daughter, and then they would go do paperwork throughout the day, come back in the afternoon. They said, one day we go in here, and they had a gymnasium map in the corner. It was like a cylinder, and it was in the corner. And they looked inside, and there was a child, another Down syndrome child, sitting there, um, and they had a bottle of chicken broth. It was like a, just a baby bottle with chicken broth in it. It was 8 a.m. They go all day long, and they're filing paperwork, they're doing all this stuff. They come back at 4, and they look in, there's the bottle, there's two other empty bottles, and it smells like feces because the, the child had been left there uh, to soil themselves all day long. Nobody even remotely checked on this kid. They just walked over, dropped a bottle of broth. That was this child's life. That was how these children lived. So I'm sitting here as an American pastor thinking I have supported missions for years. Not once had I ever heard of this condition called the global orphan crisis. Hadn't heard of it. Didn't know of it. Didn't know what it was. And so I started meeting all these other Christians who were adopting, and we all start talking and they're sharing stuff with me. So today, and I don't know how much of this you have in PowerPoint. Was the PowerPoint ready? It's okay. So we had a PowerPoint, but we're not able to connect it. So we'll just free, freestyle talk. That's all good. Um, there are today 153 million children in the world who are orphaned. This does include America. So within America, there are 400,000 children right now today who are in foster care, which means that there are 400,000 children today right now in America who, who don't have a mom and dad. They've been orphaned because of death or because of drugs or because of violence, domestic abuse, neglect, whatever it is. Uh, they're orphans. So we have 400,000 children in America, but we have 153 million children worldwide have no family, nothing. They're living in orphanages, they're living by themselves, they're living in, in the streets and sometimes in sewers, they're living all over the world. And what's the church doing about it? So if I took 153 million, that's, that would be as a population, it would be the ninth largest country in the world right behind Russia. So let's say this, there are as many orphaned children today as there is the population of Russia. It's terrifying. It's literally terrifying. And what I've seen is, I've been 17 years in ministry, and I'd never heard of this. I was ashamed of myself. So we came home with Raya, uh, with their adoption, we came home on a Saturday night. By Tuesday, I had contacted my professors at Ashland, and I said, hey, listen, like, I've been doing a dissertation on, on the spiritual warfare of change and conflict management. Like, I know I'm almost done with my doctorate. I'm scrapping everything, and I want to talk about international adoption for my dissertation. Can I do that? And, and my professor laughed. He thought I was joking. I said, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. And he said, Trevor, for accreditation purposes, like, you can totally do it, but realize you're starting a dissertation from scratch, and you only have, like, I think it was a seven-month window to finish. I got this. So I did it. The research that I had uncovered was just absolutely terrifying. How many of you know somebody or are adopted or know somebody who's been adopted or through the process? How, how many of you? So quite a few people are touched by it. One of the things I uncovered was about a million people a year um, are touched by adoption in America. So if our population in America is about 322 million people, 323 million, somewhere around there, only one million people a year are touched by adoption. Here's how we come up with that number. There are approximately 130,000 adoptions a year in America. So there are 130-ish thousand children who are adopted. About 4,500 of them are from overseas. The remaining like 125,000, 120,000 children are foster care kids or a step-parent adoption or a mom and dad died, so aunt and uncle adopt, or grandma and grandpa adopt, or whatever. It's those types of adoptions. So there's about 130,000 children. Well, by the time you include their family, okay, so you have 132,000 or 130,000 children, then you have uh, the moms and dads of those children, or right there, your number skyrockets to about 260,000. Then you have grandparents and aunts and uncles. There are about a million people a year in America who are touched by adoption. 
That sounds like a lot, but when you, when you weigh it against the staggering number of children, it's, it's just out there. So what we wanted to do today is share our stories with you, and we're going to share some personal stuff here, but I, I just want to create awareness. There, there's really no other rhyme or reason to what we're doing, but to just take today, which is Orphan Sunday. I'm not going to preach on it uh, later today. Maybe other years I will. Uh, last year I did, and I think that sermon is up on YouTube. I might actually pull that um, and post it later, but yeah, so why don't we start? You can talk a little bit just kind of about our heart for adoption and where it started and the process to get Roman and Raya and go from there. You're the better looking of the two of us, so you can probably do it a little bit better. Um, okay, so this is unprompted, and we did not plan what we were going to say. So. Well, you did, but the PowerPoint was out. That's okay. Um, Technical difficulties. I think, like, we both kind of walked through the awareness of adoption kind of in different ways. And I remember, you know, my perception of what, um, like, what the global orphan crisis was used to look a certain way in my mind. Um, and then once, you know, once we started to do missions and once we started to go down through the journey of adoption, I, you know, I, that perception changed. And I think, um, you know, just because a child might have a roof over their head or might have a meal or might have clothes to wear, that does not take the place of family. So I think sometimes there's this perception of, you know, they should look a certain way. And that's, that wasn't, you know, that's not the case. And I think sometimes th there's this awareness that's raised with certain images that kind of get, you know, placed in our mind. Um, so for, you know, from, from my journey and, and going into the awareness and raising awareness for adoption, is it doesn't, you know, it can look so many different ways. Let, let's talk for a minute there. You, you just hit on something I think is very important is the, the concept of family. So like, what, what are the needs that a child has growing up? So my grandpa was an orphan, and, and his story was he grew up in an orphanage in Dover, Ohio, and then he broke out of the orphanage at age 15, um, had lied about his age to go fight in World War II. Uh, so he joined the Merchant Marines and, and then went out. He always, I, I love my grandpa dearly, but there were what we called orphanage ticks about him. Just, just parts of his behavior that were different uh, than, than someone else. And essentially what he even tried to explain to me was, he said, you know, Trevor, I had a roof over my head, I had clothes, I had food, but I didn't have family. He had, he had a couple sisters who he was separated from, but he says, I, I didn't have family. The, the orphanage has been outlawed in America. We haven't had orphanages in America since the 1940s. Uh, we, we replaced orphanages with foster care because long ago, the social workers and, and everybody started to say, hey, we need these children to be in homes. And here's why. A child's brain is developed a certain way. So when you grow up in a family, you, you have a healthier emotional outlook. So let's say, for instance, uh, my son Cohen um, falls as a two-year-old boy and scrapes his knees and he's really sad and it hurt and he's crying. Well, I'm dad. I've bonded with him emotionally. I pick him up, I scoop him up, and I pat him on the back, and I say, buddy, it's okay, and I give him love, and, and I give him a little piece of candy, or like a full-blown candy bar or something like that, or whatever, and, and he, he knows that if I get hurt, dad will make it better. If I get scared, dad will make it better. If I'm here, mom will make it better. His brain is different, so his brain chemistry is conditioned to know, brain says, I'm hurt, here's trauma, the brain sends the right chemicals to the body and elicits the response, it's okay. Chemically, that child is healthy from what happens in his brain to his emotions and then his actions follow. So you have a child in an orphanage, and a child in the orphanage runs and falls and they scrape their knees. There is no one to help them. People will probably make fun of them or scrape them up or whatever. Tell them, suck it up, get back in line. I don't want to hear you cry. Just, just go shut up and get in line. That sends a message from their brain chemically here, and it messes with the child's fight or flight mechanisms, and it's different. So our child, Roman, you've seen little Roman run around the halls. He's probably almost knocked one of you over a time or two. I'm super sorry about that, by the way. So before the, uh, we brought Roman home, 
He spent three and a half years in an orphanage. So we get him home and it's time to get his cochlear implants and everything ready. So we go to the hospital, but part of the getting a cochlear implant is you have to have an MRI. So I take him in and we get an MRI and we had to sedate him for it. And uh, we bring him out and he's coming too. And the doctor comes in the room and he says, hey, uh, everything looks good for the cochlear, so there's no reason for alarm with that. Okay, when a doctor says that, it, it just makes you a little concerned, right? So he says, listen, he says, uh, you know, I need to talk to you about your son's brain. Okay. So he said, uh, he said, on Roman's brain, he said, there is an unusual amount of white matter. And he said, your brain is made up of, of white matter and gray matter. And he said, your gray matter is your, uh, your, your software. So he said, imagine that you have a phone. And he said, your gray matter is the software. It's the thinking mechanisms of your brain. So it's, it's basically all the information of your brain is stored in the gray matter. It processes and it does everything else there. He says the white matter of the brain is your circuitry, your hardware, your, your button, your screen, the other stuff. He said if there's an imbalance there, it affects the way the phone would function. He said for your brain, it's the same way. If there's an imbalance of white matter and gray matter in your brain, it, it messes with the way you think and you see the world. He said, Roman has an unusually high volume of white matter in the brain. Well, I'm in dissertation mode, so I go right home, and I hop on, I start doing all this research, and here's what we uncovered. In the 1980s, there was a group of orphans from Romania who came home uh, to America, and they're the first Eastern European children to be adopted. There was a big wave of them, and they started acting all sorts of peculiar so they did brain mapping. And what we've discovered is children who grow up in an institution, an orphanage, they have an excess amount of white matter on the brain. Literally, growing up in a family shapes your brain chemistry and your behavior. Growing up in an orphanage or an institution warps your, your brain. It literally rewires their brain. So a child doesn't think different and it alters their fight or flight mechanism. So what we see is these children, when you grow up, and a lot of orphanages, not, not all of them by far, but in a lot of them is white walls, okay? White walls only lowers your brain amount and it alters the behavior of children, but it alters their thinking mechanisms and everything else and it just creates a different human being. So growing up in the family just creates a better child. So our mission really with adoption and with orphan care is how can we get a child in a family environment to let them know the love, the emotions, the feel, the, the, the everything about a home and a family. Sorry. No, it's fine. He's the one that talks the most. I kind of gathered that. Um, to, add, to add to that, um, you know, when you bring a child, when we, when we brought our children home, uh, Riot and Roman, Roman was probably the most challenging mm -hmm. to watch transition into a family setting because not only could he not hear, he couldn't communicate. And he really did not like me. But um, I'm at a board meeting one night, right? So we've issues with uh, women with dark hair. We've, so. we've been in the States with Roman for a week and I, I had missed time obviously at the church. So we're just getting caught up in the elders meeting and uh, Shanna calls me and I'm like, you know I'm at an elders meeting. Like, why are you calling right now? So I ignored the call, Multiple sorry. Times. She just keeps calling, so finally I'm like, guys, I gotta go take this. And all I hear is the screaming child in the background. So I'm like, what's going on? So she turns on FaceTime, and he was chasing her, trying to bite her. He's walking up, we had a big bookshelf, and he's grabbing books. I'm watching the whole thing, and he's throwing books at her when she's walking away, trying to hit her in the face, because he had such trauma in the orphanage from these women who treated him poorly. He thought she was just another one. It was bad. It was bad. Um. But I think like when you have, like when we had that, when we had the MRI from Roman's brain, I think a lot of times, you know, you watch these families, you bring home, you know, bring home children, they add to their family, and I, there's this beautiful story of, oh, they arrived home, and they're, then after that, I think there's this perception of just because they're home, they're fine, and that's, that's not really, you know, there's so much on the flip side of that arrival home, but with Roman, it was so much easier to, once we had that scan of his brain, it was actually easier to accept his, his like his post-orphanage behavior or his 
his challenges because you know, you could literally, like we had a visual of what was going on inside his mind, as opposed to, you know, having other children where, you know, you, it's this constant reminder of having to remind yourself where they came from and what their trauma was. Because you, as a parent, and I think, you know, when you have a lot of kids, it's, you shouldn't behave that way or you shouldn't act that way or why are you doing that or, you know, it's easy to kind of get into the role of just correcting or molding, but with adoption, it's this constant reminder of having to remind yourself like where a child's come from and just because they're home doesn't mean that there's not, you know, this abundance of healing that needs to happen afterwards. And I think too, one of the things, you know, it's true, we, we look at a situation like Orphan Annie, right? We all know the movie Annie. And we think, well, boy, isn't Annie lucky she got to go live with Daddy Warbucks and, and oh my goodness, this is great. Adoption is, is you're, you're lucky because of what you bring in and do, but at the same time we have to remember, this child who you're adopting is not lucky because you found them, okay? Every adopted child in the face of the earth has experienced trauma from one step to another. So if an infant is removed from mom and dad, that infant still, I mean, as you're in utero and in tummy, you still hear voices and everything else. You're still, there's still separation there and the sensation of that. If it's a two-year-old child who's removed from mom and dad and children's services comes in and takes them away, that separation is trauma. If parents die, if there's war, if there's AIDS, if there's whatever, th that, that all is, they, they've still been traumatized. So when you're, when you're going through adoption, you have to understand that you're, you're not working with a child who's grown up with no problems or fears. You're working with a child who has endured trauma and, and, and bad trauma. And so you have to take into consideration, we're, we're grading on a curve here, okay? This, this, this is different. We're parenting on a curve. We're, we're working through this. This child's responses will not be the same as X, Y, and Z. And we see that manifest through everything. So when we brought Sophia home, uh, the first couple times I had to yell at our kids because I'm, I'm a big dude and I'm kind of, you know, my coaches all played for Woody Hayes. So like new Philly intensity is kind of there. So whenever the kids get in trouble, it's like, you know, you stop and give them a look and give them a talk. So Sophia, we bring her home. The first time I have to like stop and yell at the other kids, she's standing behind one of them and the girl just wilts. I mean, crumbles and falls down to the floor crying and wilting and I'm like that reaction did not merit what I just did what is up so the, the first couple times I had to yell at our kids or discipline them she is gone so we pulled Violetta aside because we'd known obviously Violetta long before we knew Sophia and we said hey what's going on and, and basically we found out we, we suspect we can't confirm that there's been some physical abuse and some violence in her background I can't parent this child like I've done this, because even though my kids know dad can yell at me, but he still loves me, that's not been put into her brain. I've got to build trust with this girl and work with this girl and go through that. And it's just, it's, it's traumatizing for her to go through all that. One of the things that we really, we had to learn rather quickly with adoption, <coughs> parenting, or parenting biological children, it kind of comes as a, a natural, you know, cause and effect, and you you kind of parent without having to think of who's going to say what or who's going to kind of jump in and take over. And when we brought Roman home, um, you know, having to build trust because he all he knew was women caretakers who were not kind to him. Um, it really got to a point where like we really hit a point where like we've got to do something. Um, so we switched roles. And so he became the caretaker, and I became the fun one, who most of the time just kind of had to fake it till I made it because you know he was still not wanting to bond with me. But you know, knowing that it's okay as a parent to say, okay, I can't be his caretaker right now, we've had to switch roles. So with Roman, he became. You know, Potty training was super fun. The, 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 the one who had to do the correction but also become the caretaker. So potty training and brushing teeth and getting him ready or getting him dressed or giving him food. Because even if I put a plate of food in front of him, he refused to eat it. 
And so Trevor would come home because he was. Like, he would literally for Shanna. He would like throw his plate. He, he would. He would like she'd have the food there and he'd smack the plate out of the way and get food all over the floor and, and everything. And he would and walk in the door and all of a sudden he would turn into this angel child. Daddy. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? But even with Sophia, like at first we kind of, you know, I could correct her a lot more sternly and she was more, she was okay with that versus him not so much. So we've had to learn. You know, with parenting yeah. and, and adoption and trauma, that it's you have to parent in ways that may not feel normal or natural. And with with Roman, there was actually time, and this goes back to the brain chemistry and rewiring it. He was three and a half years old when we adopted him, but because of the deafness, they had him with the infants, so he acted very infantile with, with many of his behaviors. Well, the social worker came in to check on us because there's always like a couple, like a month follow up or something like, like that. Adoption check. Well, she's hearing all of this stuff and she says, Trevor, she says, you have to cradle him like a baby. I'm like, this kid's three and a half years old. She said, no one ever did it before, Trevor. You have to hold him like a baby and literally feed him with a bottle or a sippy cup or something. I'm like, are you serious? She says, yeah, I'm serious. This is, this is getting weird. Man, sure enough. So I get him. And uh, he had a little sippy cup, and I cradled him up. I mean, this three and a half kid, and I'm rocking him like a baby and patting his back, and he has a sippy. I mean, the kid just melted, and you could just tell he had never had that. So with Roman, there were sensory issues. Yeah, he was a, um, like physical touch, like to hold him or hug him. Um, he was very non-receptive to that. Like he was very stiff and almost numb. numb. Yeah. And so sensory stuff with the child is pretty much like if I have a baby and I'm rocking a baby, even as young as that baby might be, they, they feel the warmth and the cradling and the protection of being cradled and loved. And then a child will feel right. So they feel pain, they feel pleasure, they feel certain fabrics and textures and everything else there. So these children who were orphaned, then they're this crib baby. So I feed you, I put you in a crib and no one really holds you. They have really bad sensory stuff. So Roman would fall and just get hurt. And I don't think he felt pain. For the longest time, he didn't feel pain. And so we had to rewire the sensory by, by me cradling him and doing some of that. He, you, know, you might notice when he's running down the hall, he has this very large scar on the back of his head. And when he was transitioning home, he would like act out because he couldn't, he didn't know how to communicate. Just thrashing. Him. Yeah, he would, he would literally like throw his head back on things or forward on things because you just there was this inner rage and that he which i went to be grab a birthday cake for braylon and i was gone like not even a minute he wanted to go with shanna and yeah. instead he stayed back and he threw his head back into the corner of the door she was like, I have to gashed it open and i'm like i just left the house what happened and you know the, but his response to that wasn't you know like if if kira would have done it or brielle would have done it you know when he, he would hurt himself, it's like... He hit his head, weird. then he just got up and walked away. Yeah. And when he walked away, I'm like, where's all this blood coming from? And yeah. it was there. So it's, yeah. it's that sensory. They almost have to, their brain has to relearn how to connect those feelings. But this is, this is why adoption and orphan care is important. And, and essentially, the, the church needs to take a larger role in orphan awareness throughout the globe. We do. As we, we have to figure out as Christians, and I don't mean Painesville First Church of Christ, I mean just the church globally. We have to figure out a way to bring awareness. Scripture tells us to take care of orphans. Widows and orphans are the work of the church. Okay, we have to be doing this work as Christian people. We just have to. Adoption itself is foundational to Christianity. So part of my research for my dissertation, so I'm a doctor of ministry, so there's a biblical piece of adoption we had had. And one of the things that I've uncovered is adoption is foundational doctrine of, of Scripture. Like cover to cover, adoption is huge. Grace, meaning that you and I have been saved by grace, we have been adopted into the family of God. You understand that? So, so we, like every other orphan here, our name has been changed and Christ covers us. So this is a huge theological piece of, of our faith. So doing it and being involved in that world or just acting that out, but there's some things to consider. Biblically, Moses was what we know as our first international adoption of Scripture that we see. He is adopted by this Egyptian family. It's a bad experience for him, and, and a lot of awful things happen. Later on, Samuel, his biological mother and father, turn him over to Eli the priest, and we see that there. Esther uh, has a relative adopt her. Jesus is raised by Joseph, his stepfather. 
Paul, the apostle, he's not necessarily adopted, but as a teenager, he's relocated from one country to another and placed under the guidance and guardianship of another man, Gamaliel, who grows him up. Adoption in orphan care is something we see cover to cover in Scripture. And theologically, as a part of grace, it's super important. So the church needs to create a big role. So like some of the things that we would ask ourselves is, how can we, how can we as the church be more influential with adoption? And, you, and a lot of you might say, I, I can't adopt, Trevor. I'm either uh, too old, they won't approve it, or I just don't have the energy for it or whatever. And what we've learned is adoption is not for everybody. It, it's just not. It has some very hard parts to it. But at the same time, we can all do something. So it might be, hey, uh, here's a family who's adopting. I can contribute financially, or I can't contribute financially, but I can really support them and, and be there to help or babysit or, or bring food to them or do whatever. Or, you know, I can pray for you or whatever. But the church has to do a better job being up front and engaged on what adoption is. Let's do some question and answer since we have like about 20 minutes left. Is that okay? Okay. Questions? You can just stand up where you are and we can hear you. Oh. Good job, though. <laughs> what questions do you guys have on, on anything? Adoption, our like story, very adoption, very everything? Very transparent, open, and honest. Yeah. So nothing that you think maybe I shouldn't ask us. Like, ask us because we really don't mind. Could you just, like, go through the order of how you got them? Uh-huh. So, I can do the birthdays for you. Okay. We had Braylon, Brielle, Brielle, Cohen, Kira. And then Brielle. And there's six jerseys between Braylon and Brielle. And then we had Cohen. Cohen was our last. Did y'all hear that story of Cohen and Kira? Maybe no? a couple. Okay, well, in a nutshell, Cohen was our last, and then we were done having biological. I had three children. kids, we were done. Um, at, to the point where we had a garage sale and sold literally everything except a swing and a baby swing and a couple totes that I was saving for my sister. And then later that day, you found a pregnancy found test I was pregnant, so. for a joke. She I took the last joke. pregnancy yeah. test. Um, so then that was Kira. I thought it was funny. So we had four, four. And when we had Kira, the first thing Braylon, our oldest, said, he said, well, I guess we're not adopting from Haiti now, because we'd always talked about wanting to adopt from Haiti. We actually, on the PowerPoint, we had a picture of the little girl that we had met in Haiti, and it was a complicated situation, but her, she was the one that we always hoped one day we could adopt. We could adopt. And then when she, she had passed away from an upper respiratory infection and couldn't get to a medical clinic. So when we, when we received that call that she had passed away, that was like the turning point for us of are we really going to consider adoption or not. Um, so then we had Kira, and she was what, two? I think she was two. Where are you going? When we decided to... Oh, yeah, she had been two. Uh, international adoption. So we didn't really feel that Haiti was still where we were being called because the little girl that, was, that had passed away... So we adopted, um, we got referrals like two weeks before we traveled, roughly. Mm. Um, so we got a picture of Roman first, and then we got a picture of Raya. And so then we traveled and we accepted. Ukraine as a country gives a parent like four days to make a decision. And you can, they don't match, technically they don't match children until you're literally in country. So. The day we re that we got the referrals, like we signed papers for all of our children before we even went to see them. Um, so then we brought we brought Roman and Raya home, and during our first adoption, we connected with a family who was adopting this 12-year-old girl. Um, through and this is this is where we learned about hosting, bringing children from an orphanage into your home, um, and their story just really stood out. So. We got introduced. And what did you say when we came home? Because when we came home, I said, Shanna, I think we need to get a 15 passenger van. You said no. So instead, we got another vehicle at the time because you said. We're never adopting again. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that was public. We're on record. We have a video of this now. It's all good. So we had hosted a girl 
girl who was aging out. She was not eligible for adoption, but we still felt led to bring her into our home. And her name was Dasha. Her name was Dasha. And she loved cats, which, you know, Trevor is a cat. It was, anyway. Um, so, you know, that really opened our eyes to older children adoption. Uh, we were open to adopting older children before, but at the time, like, they, you know, they told us we don't really have any children that match with, they tried to respect birth order. Um, so then we brought, we, we hosted Dasha, and then that winter we hosted Violetta and our friends. Privet the Kakila. Um, our friends at our previous church had hosted Sergey, and that's how we met him. Sergey and V were both from the same orphanage, so they had known each other, so we would go do things together, all of us. Yeah. So after we had hosted Violetta, uh, she told us that she had a little sister, which we, that was a surprise. Um, and then that's, we just went ahead and, you know, updated our home study, and here we are. Yeah, and Sergey was aging out. So at age 16, they, they age out of the orphanage. Uh, 16 in Ukraine is like they're... Oh, hi, I didn't know you were back up there, buddy. <laughs> He's like, no one sees Sergey. Sergey's up here with his leg. Um, so that's it. I mean, we went over there, and uh, first adoption was in 2015. We started it, um, I think we filed the paperwork the last week of December 2014. And then uh, that's when we had our phone conference and stuff. And then we had, we were home with the children on my mom's birthday. It was November 20th. It was a year later. Well, to, like to add this, um, and I think this is really important, um, we were we were actually told, and when we felt led to adopt again, um, our previous agency, like thankfully, our you know caseworker was very honest, and she's like, you know, they won't approve you yet because you haven't gone through like this. They set a certain timeline that they think you should follow for adoption. And that was really hard for us when we're, you know, when we're feeling very called to adopt again, being told, you know, well, you're not, you're not going with our timeline. And, you know, that was even a decision of, you know, no, we really feel led to do this. And so I think when you're raising awareness for you know, the orphan spectrum and you have families who are adopting, it's so important to be like that village for them because you don't know what they're going through behind the scenes and you don't know how they're being called, you know, to adopt. And I think, you know, if you're being, if a family is really feeling led to do that, you really need to answer God's call and find a way to make Yeah, so the story with, with Violetta, for instance, let, let's talk about that for a minute. We had uh, we'd exhausted a lot of our savings when we were going through our first adoption. And, and we just we, we trusted God for that, right? We, we just knew, okay, God, you're calling. I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense. We're going to do it. So by the time it was, we were ready to adopt Violetta, Shanna had come up and she said, hey, um, there's, there's a girl I see here. I'd like to host her over Christmas. And I said, Shanna, we, can, we can't afford it. Like, we just can't do it. And she said, but I just think someone needs to do this. Hint, hint, cough, cough, wink, wink. And I'm like, Shanna, honey, we, we can't do this. Like, we, we just can't afford to host her. And uh, she said, no, really. Um, I, I just, maybe we can just advocate for another family. So that was Friday night. The Saturday morning afterward. There was a 48-hour window before certain children were going to be pulled out. They would have been cut off the list and not able to be hosted. Yeah. So anyway, um, I woke up that Saturday morning feeling bad. Because here I am, I'm a pastor. I've written a book on faith called Boundless. I had just done that for our first adoption. So I'm like, I've literally wrote a book about faith, and I'm not living by faith. So I'm like, all right, whatever, God, I'll, I'll, I'll even out. So I told her, I said, if you're, if you're wanting to try this, we, we can try it and just throw it out there. So Saturday morning, we had said, hey, um, we made a post on Facebook and said, we're, you know, we, we think we're going to go ahead and, and host this girl, but it's going to cost like $3,000 which we didn't have, $2,950, which we didn't have. By Sunday night, we'd had it paid off within 36 hours, pretty much. And it was like, oh, okay, God, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> See how you are. But uh, yeah, that worked out really well. But that's the story, adoption and faith. Yeah, we are, I'm sorry. <laughs> she just told me to shut up. Yes, sir. 
Yes, thank you so much for asking that. That was our first thought. When we had talked about maybe adoption, we talked about foster care. Um, <clears throat> the situation for our family was, I, I was adopted uh, myself as a foster care child in 1980. Um, we as a family and ministry who had kind of a high profile you know, at the time, we were, the, the church we were leading was a 1,200 member church. So we were a very large church in a, in a community that wasn't any bigger than Painesville. Um, we were, uh, we are on commercials, our Facebook stuff is there, the church is there. The, the likelihood of us running into a biological member of that child's family and having a very serious confrontation was very high. For us, and in my personal situation, I uh, with with my adoption that actually happened to me, uh, where, where down the road some family members came out, started threatening my parents and myself and some other stuff, and we just thought as a family, um, foster care is for certain. I mean, it, some people might say, "Hey, I'm called to foster care." Some people might say, "Hey, I'm called to to orphans abroad." In, instead of that. Uh, for us, that was why we went the road we did. For another family, they might say, I ain't touching the international thing with a 10-foot pole, but I want to go through foster care. We've, we've worked with both. Uh, I have a cousin who adopted through foster care, uh, two great kids. Um, that was just kind of our situation there. And I think the other thing for us, it is, it's, I think it's different for everybody. There's this, there is a transitional period that is very sacred and, and also intense though for children who are already in a family and it is very unfortunate that in the world of foster care it's constant transition yeah it's constant back and forth there's you know every child's situation is different so if you have a child and your your children at home seeing these kids forth, coming out we were fearful for them it's very it's always a heightened intensity um, so that was another reason why. And I will say this, we actually did do foster care just for one summer. We did it last year. We, we had a boy with us for the summer and uh, it was rough. Um, and, and it wasn't that it was good or bad or indifferent. It was just that um, as, a, as a family who cares for children, you have to really be open and honest with your skill set. How can I help a kid and how has God equipped me and my family to help? Uh, I think his situation I don't know how well equipped we were as a family to help his specific needs, but what we were able to do was we were able to connect him with another family who was able to take him. And, and I, know, I know he's doing well now, but we did do the foster care thing for a summer. We, we didn't have it public because of being foster care, because of the profile stuff, but we, we did do that. It, 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 it was rough. Trevor handled it a lot better than I did. Yeah, but even with that, it was still, it was rough. I could tell you stories that I can't say publicly. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. No other questions on anything? Yes, ma'am. I've always heard about how expensive it is to adopt. Yes. Yeah. Well, the hosting fees we raised, the, the total between both of our adoptions was a little over $100,000. It was 102000 is what it came to. Um, I learned after the first adoption, which was very expensive, um, for the second adoption, there were a lot of corners we could cut, and we did. We, we cut them substantially, saved a lot of money, because that price tag could have been even higher. That money is not, you're not buying a kid. We, we, we brought Raya home and Cohen was four. When we go to church the first Sunday with Raya, and Cohen walks up to somebody in church and he says, we bought her. <laughs> <sighs> Nobody. You know, it's, uh, you gotta pay money, a couple thousand dollars for your home study, and then you gotta translate all of that and create what's called a dossier, and that's, I think it's like 3,500 bucks, and then you have an adoption fee, and their agency, because their full-time job is helping families. They, get, they got food they have to eat for their families too, so there's fees there, and then there's airfare, lodging, in-country adoption fees, it adds up. 
So anyway, we had raised about a little over 60,000 uh, toward that 102, and then basically we had to cover the, the remaining. Um, no, I mean, honestly, like her question maybe a little bit less than was 60. our question in the very beginning. Yeah. Like, you know, you're sent this breakdown of, you know, oh, you know, your application was accepted. Now, here's all your fees. And so that's really hard when you're in step one to think, how in the world are, are we ever going to do this? And because yeah. every, every piece of paper, you know, it's, there is a cost behind that. So it's not that you're, you know, th but that's a common question. Like, it shouldn't cost that. It shouldn't cost that much money to adopt a child. Now, whether, you know, domestically or internationally, there's, there is travel and airfare and lodging, but, you know, you expect those things. It's, you know, you are paying for people's services. You are paying for, you know, I need you to sign this paper for me. I need you to I'm, file that paper I'm for me. I need you to all of your your things across the world. So by the time you get legal to, fees, court fees, you know, court you costs, get through the rest of this process. So you're you are paying for services. You're paying for things to be accurate. You're paying for notaries and, and things to be precise. So when you are at that end place. You know, you don't come up with, oh gosh, I didn't expect this to happen. Now I have to pay. And, I, and I'll be honest too. What, one of the things that I've seen with families who have adopted is, or who have adopted internationally, it's a lot cheaper to do it domestically. So, so when you do adopt through foster care, um, it's not that there's no cost to it. There's still legal fees you have to take out, but that's pretty much it domestically. There, it's just, it, it's, it's, where is God calling you? Those who adopt internationally, though, I have seen several families who, who have ended up with great financial difficulties afterward um, because you, you, you know you, you have to go do X, Y, and Z with faith. Some people refinance their homes. Some people get stuck with a, with a bad decision or whatever, and it's, it's, it's rough. And, and before our adoptions, financially, where we were before and after, I mean, if I'm being real, it's two very different places. And I know the, the financial challenges where, where we were at before, you know, you, you guys are aware of, but um, where, where that situation for our family and ministry was very difficult was we were in a vulnerable place financially because we had just taken everything we had and put our eggs in a basket of, you know, could, could we stay at home with four kids? We're both working full-time jobs and, and not, not bad full-time jobs at that. So we could be in a world where we have a good savings, we have a good cash flow, we're both working, but we're not helping anybody or doing anything. Or is it that we go through this, mom now has to stay home because we have nine kids, here's our savings, bye-bye savings, we want to help these kids because we feel God called. And it left us in a very vulnerable place financially, and that, that was hard. Both of our adoption processes, though, were, we were, they both were different. Like, our first yes. adoption was, you know, this, this step of faith of, like, we're talking about it, but we're not acting on it. Is that okay? Is that okay to you know talk about global orphan crisis and you know you should do something, but we're not actually taking any steps to do that. So you know the whole boundless faith that we walked through, and then our second was more of an, of an act of obedience. God is God calls us to do this. So I think that you know for for both of our adoptions, it was you know two different points that we were at that came together. I was literally, I, I had wrote a book in 2015 called Boundless, and it was basically an old test, a retelling of the stories of faith in the Old Testament. And I was writing a chapter about David and Goliath, and, and I remember like a ton of bricks. I was really being headstrong about the adoption thing and being, dragging my feet on it a little bit because how are we going to afford this? It's going to change our family dynamic extensively. You know, how will these kids' personalities blend with mine? I had it all going through my head. I remember uh, it was as if uh, I, it was the loudest I think I've ever heard God speak saying, you're writing a book about faith right now, David and Goliath, mind you, and what are you doing to back this up? And I remember setting my computer aside and just thinking, you're killing me. <laughs> but that, that was where it all started for me. So like the theme for our first adoption was boundless. It was uh, how far on faith are we willing to go? even if it hurts, because faith will hurt. We probably have maybe time for one or two more questions if you want. So you adopted two kids the first time? Yes. 
Yes. yes. But you weren't planning on the three on No. No. <laughs> We had talked with Violetta. We had her for two weeks. The things I can't say when our children are in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had talked with Violetta, and, and she wanted a family, and, and we had talked about her, and, and her and I had a really good chemistry up front, too, so I love her to death. Okay. And I would say that if you were in your room. Real, real quick, though. Like, when we got to the point where, where we knew for sure we, we definitely want to adopt Violetta and her little sister, and we want them to be part of our family. Sarah was, was aging out, and we knew that because we spent time with him, I actually spent more time with him than Trevor did. Um, so we had, we, our home study was almost finalized. Like, we were literally waiting for, like, a signature. And, you know, Trevor came to me, and he was like, you know, I kind of feel God saying that we need to get approved for three kids, like, just in case. Because we, our first adoption, we were in country, and um, there was a, a, another child that had we been approved or, you know, an additional child, we probably would have pursued that child. He's Andre, down, and, yep. He was really, he was like Raya's best friend. He was with Raya on New Orphans. He had Down syndrome, he was five years old. So Trevor comes to me and he said, you know, I really feel God calling us to get approved for another child. And it, it took me, I remember I was sitting in a little cafe while Braille was at a birthday party, painting party, and I called him on the, on the phone and I said, hey, God's really putting this on my heart. I just don't know what you're going to think about it. And I was really hoping that, you know, I felt God saying that we needed we needed to ask Sarah to be part of our family too. So that's that's how like you know I I said okay you told me this and now I'm going to tell you what God's been telling me. So you know it was this that's how that came together of, of how we ended up with you know three kids bringing home. God was working with both of us in different ways, and we just kind of brought that together. And, and they're awesome. I, I cannot yeah, imagine our life. I cannot imagine our life without Sergey, even with your blown out knee. <laughs> so our joke is pretty much that Sergey and I like are long lost biological father son somehow, because all of my physical ailments have now gone on to him in the second generation. <laughs> I was 18 years old when I blew my knee out in the sport. He's 18 years old. He blew knee, his, his knee out in the sport. I think it is what it is. such a, how God and its families together, when you were living it firsthand and you, you, you can witness, like, oh my gosh, you know, this child has these similarities and these, you know, traits and these mannerisms that are so much like their parent, that, you know, that they now have. And so, yes. We kind of joke that we think. And Violetta and Sarah, or Violetta and Sophia have my blue eyes. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. I cannot, I can't, I can't. You can have, claim Raya. I can't have girls that look like me. They all come out and they look like him. Even our adopted <laughs> ones look like me. Yeah. But no, I would just encourage you guys, uh, just keep, keep an eye out and just really ask yourself and pray through, um, how, how can God use you uh, toward the plight of the orphans? And, and that would really be it, is, is just to pray for people, to pray for families, uh, network, all that stuff there. There's just so many different ways to do it. But I would just say, just, just ask God, to, how, how, can you, how can you help with the orphan crisis? That's it. I, yeah, I think for us, you know, we had a handful of people. I had a, a friend who, our first adoption, um, you know, she had reached out to me and she said, I, I can't help you, I can't support you, I have no money, you know, to, to help with this, but this really, you know, she, she was like my prayer warrior, and I knew without a doubt that if I asked her, will you please pray about this, because this is a challenge that we had, like, she was literally... Did you just hit yourself in the face with the mic? No, it wasn't. Oh, it looked like you hit the mic. No, okay. Okay. Funny. okay. Um, <laughs> Not awkward at all. I, I, mean, I think just taking a role, if it is just being that strong prayer warrior and being intentional about that, like, I will pray for you. How can I just keep asking if you know an adopted family, like, how can I pray for you? Or how can I pray for your child that you just brought home and you're now, you know, going through this transition? Or it doesn't always have to be financial. Yeah. But oh, yeah. do something. Because I think so often, 
there's this perception of, oh, they're home and everything's fine and everything's going well. We, we had one woman who had done foster care down in Marion. I mean, she had been with what, Sandy, 300 plus kids or whatever. Oh, yeah. She literally comes in one time to our house and she, Shanna's stubborn, but Sandy out stubborn Shanna and she said, listen, I'm doing your laundry. She's like, she I'm taking it. Up and just take it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. no so no, she no, makes no. us take no. a bunch of trash bags, put all of our clothes in this. She had an industrial washer at her house. She takes it all down there and did every garment of clothing. Some of them maybe she shouldn't have saw. She even, she even had these, like, these tips of, you know, when she's, you know, parented, you know, she would have to take the trash bags and put them in there. She would have to take the trash bags and put them in there. She would have to take the trash bags and put them in there. She would have to take the trash bags Giving cooking advice, meals and yeah, giving advice though to parents who if you've not parented a, a child from trauma sometimes the normal common sense things doesn't really work so much but yeah I, you know when it comes to advocating and raising awareness that is advocate raise awareness be an encourager be that supportive person where you know I know it's hard, I know you probably, because you do, you feel like you are literally walking through this whole journey alone, and your biggest supportive people become people who aren't in your community, who aren't in your family, who aren't necessarily even in your church because they don't understand. There's this solitary... There is a specific type yeah. of anxiety, fear, and emotion that comes over you in the process, and it's, yeah. it's hard you to explain. Only, but. It's like the only people who actually get it are the people who are actually doing it. And so I think it's very important not only to be aware and not only to raise awareness, but to be an encourager and someone who will pray for them or just you know, find a way to, if you know, adopt a feeling who's going through that, find some way to be active in their life because... They feel alone, and they may not want to talk about it. They may not want to share what they're going through because they know you won't understand. But even just to be that person, you know, to, to be present in their life is very important. Yep. We should pray. I guess church is going to start in a little bit. I got a mic. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All right. Guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time this morning. I just, like I said, I just want to take time today with it being Orphan Sunday. And just as a church talk, because we, you, I don't know how much you knew about our situation or not, but uh, just our heart and how we got there and everything else there. If you ever have any other questions, let us know. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for this day and time. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just continue to watch over us and as a church and, and the kids. And now as, as, as these orphans and, and, and children around the world need homes, we just pray that you would help lead them to families. And Father, our adoptive family now kind of comes together with Painesville Church. And we're all a big family here and, and family in Christ. And so now you have all of us together. So Lord, you have a work and role uh, for adoption and orphan care somehow through this church. And we just pray that you would continue to use our church together now as, as we all have blended together uh, to do something for, for the orphans as well. And Lord, we just pray that you would just continue to bless and thrive. And so we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs>